Hey, welcome to this episode of Chad's Beer Podcast with me, Chad of Chad's Beer Reviews, featuring Matt from Massive Beers. What's going on, man? Not much, man. Um, just chilling, um, mm -hmm. drinking a beer, and just getting off a review with you. So life is good. Yeah, in case anybody missed it, Matt and I just reviewed Fuller's London Pride. And um I'm I'm moving on to Paul Honor Hefeweizen because I, I bought a whole six pack, which is something I rarely do these days. Yeah, I'm I'm on the logger game too, but mm. stateside pre pre pro logger from uh yeah. Tabby, who is one of, just a great brewery. Yeah, no, that's a pretty cool can. Yeah, which I don't it's usually actually... like. I don't usually like text based cans, but uh, like it just depends like the color scheme and like the just pre pro in big letters like that's pretty yeah. eye catching. It's part of a new brand for them. They just did a rebrand. I want to say over the past maybe six to twelve months. So um, yeah, they got it right. Yeah, it's funny because uh, you I saw the other day you said you celebrated your ten year anniversary on YouTube. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty and crazy. Actually, I'm, let me show um, show the photo. This is this is Matt's channel, Massive Beers, and you're up to. Well, actually, that's that's just under four. So your last beer review was episode four thousand four hundred seventeen. Yep. Wow. That'd be me. I think you yeah. have more episodes than even Darwin. I know he's like three thousand something, and I'm only on fifteen hundred. And I've been doing this since two thousand eight. Although I did take a couple years off here and there. So I mean, you must have done a, a, an episode a day for at least like for ten years, right? Well, yeah. I mean, well. If you, you know, 4,000, 10 years. So you're talking about what an episode every day in a three quarters Plus or something. Like that. But, um, um, yeah, I mean, for a while there, like my, um, starting the channel kind of coincided with me becoming single, um, and, you know, loving craft beer and stuff like that. And then getting into it, I figured, you know, I'd do it. And, and I threw myself into it pretty wholeheartedly. Um, and w what I would do is I'd basically do like three to four beers uh, reviews in a session and i do it like twice a week i do like three to four beers so you know i sit down and i do like you know review 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 and then next day do review 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 and then that's my content you know yeah, and did that for a while yeah. and then a couple couple years ago kind of pushed back and now i i do like i don't know a couple a week now you know so it's definitely died died down a little bit yeah i was gonna say i know darwin does the same thing like you can tell um, just from like he doesn't change his shirt between between episodes. <laughs> yeah, me too. Like, but I also wear the same clothes all the time, so it's hard to tell. That's me. Like <laughs> like all my my cartoons, like here and up there and everything. Like it's all a white collared shirt because I'm I'm like Superman. I have like an entire closet of these. <laughs> since, ever since I moved, I I don't know if you know, I used to live in Albany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where that's where I started the show, and then I moved to Florida in 2015. And then uh, I moved to my current apartment in 2018 and just like the way my job is like I'm outside all the time. It's like, I just wear like a white golf shirt and like khaki shorts, or I mean, I'll wear pants in the winter if it's cold, you know, but I mean, I basically, I have like, a, I don't know, seven or eight or nine of these. Like, they're all from like different brands and stuff. But, like I always pick them up like when I'm at Walmart or the mall or something like that, you know, because like if they get dirty, you just throw them in the wash and you can bleach them. Yeah. It's also it's too hot and too sunny to wear anything darker than white in Florida during the day. I mean, if I worked <laughs> nights, maybe I'd wear I'd wear darker colors. Yeah, I'm the same man. I got a uniform to wear <laughs> t-shirts and t-shirts and and cargo shorts when I'm not working. When I'm working, typically just jeans. Not that we have a, a dress code at my job or whatever. I just yeah. don't usually wear shorts because I got tattoos everywhere. So that's that's what I was gonna ask. Do you work from home or? Uh, sometimes, um, I'm lucky enough that I can. Um, mm -hmm. I just started a new job. I want to say about uh, 45 days ago. Um, uh, so I would do in-house graphics for a, a manufacturer. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I can, I can work from home whenever I want. Like they encourage me to work from home. So, um, so, but I thought my office, I have like a little office in the location I work and that's about 30 minutes from where I am. So sometimes I go in, sometimes I stay home. 
uh, whatever works for me in the day. And, you know. So are you like a, a web designer or like you design? Like no, no, no. I do like stuff or? actually, actually like, a, like, a, so the company I work for is a cryogenic company um, and they make cryo products, basically cold fruit CO2 stuff. So um, Dr. Scholl's like wart mm -hmm. remover, like skin tag remover, like uh, stuff like that. And I create um, the, the boxes, like if you buy a box, that thing you tear open to get to it, that's what I make, essentially. I do a lot more than just that. I do, you know, video editing and and and, um, and we run webinars and all kinds of stuff like that. So jack of all trades kind of thing. But it's mostly in-house graphic design for a medical product manufacturer is what I do as my day job. Yeah. More, uh, more generically, I've been a graphic designer uh, for my whole life, and that's been pretty much my job. Do you draw by hand or on the computer? <laughs> Um, both. Um, yeah. So like, uh, most of, most of it's graphic design. So if you're going to really delineate between the two, one's illustration, one's graphic design, graphic design is graphics, vector graphics, and there's draw hand drawn stuff. I can do both. Um, so that's why, you know, a lot of times you see like an instructions on the back of a, a thing of someone using a product or whatever. You usually don't do that in, in Ill graphic design. It needs to be illustrated. So I grab my little iPad here, my little pen, Draw away, <laughs> you know what I mean, and stuff like that. So yeah, do both. You have to draw those uh, IKEA cartoons that show you how to assemble something. <laughs> yeah, actually, I do. I did. That's what I do. I we we call them. Well, the industry calls them pictograms, mm -hmm. um, and I have to draw those all the time. I do. <laughs> yeah. I love that the uh, the oscilloscope behind you. You have like your mic run into that. I am so so. I've always been like a. I'm, I'm a music musician. For years and um i've always had a thing for oscilloscopes and sound mm -hmm. i've always wanted a oscilloscope for the sole purpose of doing this exactly um <laughs> and and but you know they can be expensive and i just you know whatever i couldn't be bothered to track one down and about a year ago uh, someone that lived 15 minutes away from me and i live in on a farm in the middle of nowhere 15 minutes away from me was selling this vintage one in perfect shape for 35 american dollars so i was like sold sold so there so you go how, how did you run the mic into that uh oscilloscopes are pretty simple um or is there a microphone like, on it and it's just it's no 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 so i record like I, there, there's a microphone right here hanging that's where my mic mm -hmm. boom mic is and that feeds into what's called a zoom h6 which is like a um it's a it's a recording device that you can plug XLR cables into. It's pretty tiny. It's about this big. It's what I use to do a travel podcast. Um, and that has that goes out into my mixing board over here, which is how I hear you. There's also a mic monitor. So I just ran the mic monitor, which outputs the second set of sound. I ran that into the oscilloscope. So whatever goes into my audio device goes to two different places. One to the oscilloscope, one to my mixing cool. board. I just wanted to just show the folks at home your uh, your YouTube channel. Oh, look at that, baby! Yeah, I haven't Old sorted my oldest. Um, yeah, your beard was a lot darker there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. Like you started in your kitchen, then you moved to your living room. And I can see your like bottle collection behind you, and then because I yeah. remember, I don't remember when I first started watching you, but I I just remember this room with all the mm -hmm. were these empties or were these full bottles? Like those are in, those are empties. Okay. Um. Yeah, what I would do is, oh man, I got rid of that. People hated that I got rid of that. Um, they're like, oh, the, the beer wall's gone, but I can't really do it now because there's a whole room behind me here. It's like I'd be blocking my yeah. room. Um, but um, yeah, I just kind of just didn't know what to do, so I started recording in my kitchen, and I had this extra room at my house there with a the kind of fireplace and put a bunch of bottles on it, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner. And then it mm -hmm. kind of evolved to where I put shelves on the side and. And just, you know, anytime I had a beer that I thought was amazing, I'd put it up there. So it'd be like kind of like two things. One, I'm like, I like this beer. And and two, at the end of the year, I could be like, this is one of my favorite beers I've had all year. And it'd be an easy way to kind of recap that. And then it would rotate it out over years. You know what I mean? Like I'd take some down, throw them away, put different ones up, stuff like that. So it evolved, yeah. you know, several different ways over the years. Yeah, I used to do that when I lived in Albany. And uh, I'd put them on the top of the cupboards in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um but like they were never on camera i might have showed them off i actually i did i, I remember doing a video where i showed off all like it's because it was all like stuff i couldn't get like anything from russian river or three floyds or west e12 things like that yeah um, yeah and i stopped collecting 
bottles and cans. Actually, it seems like everything's in cans now, which <laughs> cans don't really have the, the cachet of the bottles, but um, I do love the labels because, like, you know, I get most of my beer on Tavor now. And, okay. Like, like, they have, like, really cool labels, and, like, I'll just save the, the peel off the label and put it on some random okay. piece of paper. And I think, like, once I get enough... When I get enough, I'll have, like... Maybe I'll do the entire wallpaper, just, like, put, like, all beer labels or beer can labels up there. I don't know. It just seems like a shame to throw them out. It's like, some of these have, like, such nice... Artwork. I don't know. I, have you ever seen a uh, fat orange cat where you can, where you mm -hmm. live? Yeah. Yeah. I thought, yeah we get was pretty cool. We get that quite a bit. Um, they're a 12% beer project uh, brewery. They actually have their own brewery up in New England area, but they dish, they brew and distribute at a place called 12% beer project, which is um, basically yeah. people that either have breweries um, that don't have the production to be distributed, just brew in that facility. Um, to produce enough beer to go out to distro. So we see them quite a bit. And honestly, you know, with my, you know, I worked 18 years in, in the tattoo industry. Um, and then I, I left that in 2017 to go into a um, nine to five job for a graphic design, doing it in house for various companies. Mm -hmm. So with my, my graphic design background, that's a part of my reviews. I always talk about label design, whether I like it, what's wrong with it, what's nice about it, because it's, I live in that world. You know what I mean? That's like, I, I have to, I have to, I have to make art that not just looks good, but also is compliant, and makes sense, and, and, and uh, of not not just for cat. humans, but for cats. <laughs> it has to, you know, a fat orange cat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I love art on uh, on the bottles, but I don't collect anything anymore. I have I have a lost small shelf up here. You can't see that I put beers that I enjoy over the year. So at the end of the year, when I do my like best ofs, I have mm. kind of like a little cheat sheet. And then I throw them away after that. Yeah, it's kind of. I was gonna say we kind of have something in common because, like, I used to be. I don't know, if, and if you are, I used to be huge into comics. Like, never was actually. Never was really? a comic person. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. You would think being in art and stuff like that, I appreciate it. You know what I mean? And I and I enjoy it. Not that I hate comics books. I'm more of a video game art. That's where my nerdery mm -hmm. really comes in. But yeah, but I worked with a bunch of people that went to illustrative school for comic books that have written comic books, so I know the world. Yeah. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an artist and I actually I went to community college like majoring in art and like I got that like I was doing like a couple art classes and like I just realized like I didn't have the talent for it. Like everybody else mm -hmm. in the class was just like smoking me and I'm just like, oh, I suck as an artist. And I just <laughs> wasted all, I just wasted all this money. I mean, thank it was only community college. So it was only like, you know, a couple hundred bucks back in the 90s. But uh, and also, I mean. I blame my parents. They didn't encourage my hobby, you know. So I used to like to draw, but my mom was always like, "That's a waste of time," you know. And yeah, I could get do like a real job, and um, yeah. So I mean, I just was like self-taught. And then when I actually went to college, I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm not very good at this." So I'm like, I got to change my major. I change it to journalism. Um, but this this is all this is all way back in the mid '90s. That's a long time ago. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're probably right around the same age. What? what how old are you? Uh, I was born in 76. Me too. So I'll be 48 in September. Ooh, right. I got your beat. Yeah. I got your beat, buddy. I was born <laughs> in January, so I'm already 48. Oh, you just turned? Okay. Well, you yeah. probably graduated in 93 then, right? 94. Still 94. Oh. Because, yeah, because, um, because you were born in when again? September. September. So what, when in September? 9976. That's why I'm Chad 9976 everywhere. So that you were either right on or before or after the cutoff for school. Remember how cutoffs in school were like, it was like early September. So, so you know, yeah, if I, don't, born I, don't know. I, I think it varies from state to state. And also, I mean, it's like, it's weird because in Florida, the kids start, they go by like college schedule. Like they start school in August and they're done in May. But when I okay. when I was a kid, we started school like it was like the, usually the first Monday after Labor Day. We didn't finish mm -hmm. until me too mid June. Yeah. yeah, yeah, similar for me. Oh, we should do like a uh, retro nostalgia podcast or something, you know? Yeah, go, maybe <laughs> look up what was the best selling beers in 1994, and we can just do a panel of of crappy macro lager. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, just like I'm talking like pop culture, like uh, Simpsons, yeah, that too. and you know. Yeah. Uh, I, my, my girlfriend, I don't know how, but like 
she's only a couple of years younger than me and she never saw any of the star Wars movies. She never saw any of the Indiana Jones movies. Wow. She never saw friends or Seinfeld. So like we've been watching that on Netflix and it's like, I like, it's so, like, I, it's all stuff I've seen a million times, but like um, it's fun watching it with her. Cause she's just now seeing it for the first time, you know? Yeah. That's kind of wild that she's not that far off in age, but yeah. some people don't grow up and you know, with TV and pop culture being the, the, the yeah. prominent thing in their life so so i you know i have a three-year-old son so i'm gonna i get to relive all these childhood things that i dug as a kid and now like i gotta watch ducktales and and all these kind of random shows that i dug on so i, I can kind of get what you're playing down yeah cartoons are timeless like that you know mm -hmm. so anyway uh did you grow up in new jersey so I was born in born in I want to say raised in New Jersey, um, and until I was like ten to twelve or something like that, my parents moved to the Poconos, northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, so I did my formative years there, um, and then um, just so happens uh, in 2017, um, I met my wife, um, and uh, she's a farmer. Huh. So you know you can't move a farm, so. I moved back down here because I, you know, I live on her farm, uh, our farm, I guess you'd say now, but, um, yeah, it just brought me back to Jersey. Now I lived in New Jersey when I was younger. I lived in the seaside. I basically lived in Tom's river. It was right by seaside Heights, which everybody knows from Jersey shore and stuff like that. Where I live yeah. now is actually like, I'm, I'm like 10 minutes away from Pennsylvania, maybe 15. So I'm like right by the Delaware water gap. So I'm, mm. I'm in the middle of nowhere. People think of Jersey, you think of Sopranos and the shore. No, I yeah, live on a yeah. farm in the middle of nowhere with trees and cows and chickens. And stuff. I know it's <laughs> Southern New Jersey is kind of like upstate New York like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the house you're in now, that's a different house from like the majority of your uh, channel, like with all the bottles in the background and everything. Yeah, I mean, the bottle background thing kind of was followed me. Like, I lived in northeastern Pennsylvania, a couple different places, and that that kind of backdrop motif kind of followed me wherever I went. It did follow me to here. So when I moved to New Jersey this past time, this last time, um, the, uh, uh, we live in an apartment attached to a larger house that houses my brother-in-law and mother-in-law, and they're all the farmers. So they, they, that's what they do. Um so where I lived, it was a two bedroom apartment. Um, and I set up my little wall of beer there. Um, but then when we decided to have a baby, I was like, Oh, well, I got to get rid of my office. Cause I got to build a bedroom for my kid. I threw all that out. And then as I mentioned previous to hitting a record, I, um, I needed some place to have for my own, you know? Um, so I bought a, sh a 20 foot by 10 foot um, Amish shed and that's what I'm in now. So I ran electrical and cable and all this stuff to it and built it out and framed it out as like a tiny home. Um, is there, so is there a video on your channel showing it off or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, if you just type in, uh, if you go to my channel and type in search, just studio, um, it'll show you the progression of updates of me building this out. Like I built, I did everything. It was a shell and, um, Oh yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So if you, you know, it goes from episode one, um, to, you know, whatever. And it's me mm -hmm. building it out. It came out basically, if you scroll all the way up, you see the top video, it's just yeah. a hollow frame. It's a hollow frame. So I, fr you know, I framed it, insulated it, uh, drywalled it, painted it, put in the flooring, Put in the electrical, you know what I mean? Basically built a small little tiny house, except I had the hull, the shell of it already built. Um, but it's my it's it's like a 10 by 20 foot. You can't really see because it's so dark, but it's like you know, I have a little home theater over there, you know, it's yeah. like an 85 inch TV, 4K, all that crap, and I got a little server rack there. Um, I'm a musician, so I have all my music stuff is over here, and then this is like my little centralized corner. Uh, where I do like either work from home or do my beer review stuff and stuff like that. I'll have to show you if you're into video, if you're into like retro video games, uh, there's this channel I follow called big old words and he has kind of a similar setup as you. He has this entire, it's almost like a pool house or something. Um, just of his uh, NES collection and it's like a game room or something. Here it is. Let me turn the sound off. I'm trying to like, so he has like oh, a whole, yeah, yeah. whole wall of like just Nintendo NES games. Yeah. Like if you see up behind me here, 
you see like silhouettes of things mm-hmm. um, up behind me uh, over my shoulder. See, there's like a silhouettes of things up there. So the way my shed is done, there's, there's a shell. So above me is a loft. Okay, for storage, but I'm also going to put like a bed up there in case I have guests or so they have their own spot. So Mm -hmm. basically, there's a 16 foot shelf on either side of me, and that's filled with all kinds of video games, you know, all kinds of tchotchkes and random stuff. So it's like a man cave. (laughs) Yeah, that's essentially what it is. It's just a man cave, but um, you know, I built it. The cool part about it is sands a little bit help from a couple friends. I built it all by myself. I just come out here and and hack at it and it was a pretty great experience this is all the stuff my dad taught me when i was when i was younger about building houses and framing houses so it was just a fun experience just to build something from scratch you know yeah my my man cave is just this this is supposed to be like a dining room and like i just turned the the desk 90 degrees i had the wall behind me instead of in front of me you know and, yeah you know I have this bookshelf with like all these beer books and uh then like here's my my mini fridge with the beer in it and uh I put these, I put these like lights in. Um, and I thought it was, it, it's funny. Like these lights are actually controlled by an app on my phone and I can like make them dance or like change the colors, but it's like, it's just like on a rainbow color and like it moves like really slowly and have mm-hmm. some like remote puck lights in here. I might get lights like this to go into the beer fridge. Um, yeah. yeah, you're preaching to choir, brother. I'm I'm mm-hmm. I'm a gadget. I'm a gadget geek. So all this, like all like all my stuff, like I have I have what's called a stream deck. Mm-hmm. Oh um, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it and it has like I I can like turn my lights down by a knob, turn them either each one change the temperature, turn them both off. I can I have my beer fridge wired to where I can click a button and it turns the beer fridge off, so I don't have like excess sound and stuff like that. Yeah. So I have like everything kind of like wired, like my remote. I have my um. My, I have blinds, you know, and they go up and down, and I can control them with a the little stream deck, and they can go up and down and stuff. No, like I total... geek out. I'm, I'm a, te- I'm a tech geek, so I like all the yeah. little gadgets and toys and trinkets and stuff. It's like a that, total so. smart house or smart shed. <laughs> smart shed. Yeah, I call it what a she shed, right? Smart mm. she shed. Is it air conditioned? Yes, um, yes, it's air conditioned right now just through a window AC unit. So the only thing I have left to do in here, the heavy lifting, because there's still stuff I need to do, but the heavy lifting is I actually have to get my electrical hooked up proper. So like um, here, actually, I'll, I'll show you um, real quick. Uh, let's see. So this is where I live. Let me click on this. And then let's go to that. Okay. And uh, can I grab that? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, perfect. And then share screen window. Okay, so this is where I live. Um, if you want to add that to the show. Sure. Um, so this is where I live. Um, this is the property mm-hmm. I live on. So this is the house I live in. It's a farm, like I said. So this is a gigantic barn. Um, mm-hmm. you can see here, this little shed here, that's where I'm, I'm at. Oh, okay. You can see how like all the, all the ground is disturbed right here. So I actually dug a huge yep. trench and ran electrical and all that stuff from this barn into here. So I could have proper electrical. I actually haven't hooked that up yet. Um, mm-hmm. everything in here is ran through extension cord, um, because it doesn't need a ton of it, but I have like, um, a proper, like a split AC unit. I don't know if you know what those are. It does heat and air conditioning. Um, but I can't hook it up till I get the proper electrical kind of hooked in. So hmm. that's the only thing. It's AC through window unit until I get that other piece. You have to get like somebody it. from the city to inspect it or something like that. Mm, I probably do, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> the only everything's actually run. Everything's run. All the wiring is run. Like everything's run. I'm just absolutely hundred percent terrified of electricity. Like irrational funny, fear level. Yeah, um, I used to be an electrician in the navy. Yeah, so I I don't want to I don't want to hook it up. I don't want to do the final hookups like like the the um the sub panel is in that connects the the cabling is run through conduit to the to the main panel. Like I I, I know how to do that, but the 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 uh, the finishing touches of connecting it and hooking it up and making sure everything doesn't explode. I have I like I dro- drove the grounding rods. Like everything's been done. I just have to have somebody come over and finish it up. But I just haven't done it because I haven't had need yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you're on a farm. What do they grow there? Um, nothing. 
<laughs> <laughs> so uh, my wife, uh, um, she actually, well, we have, you know, we have cows and chickens and goats and stuff like that, like typical farm stuff. It's not a produce farm. Mm-hmm. It's a livestock farm. Uh, but the, the, the whole, the reason for the farm is sheep. Um, mm-hmm. My wife makes yarn for a living. That's what she does as her main source of income. And so uh, we're, the ultimate goal is to get sheep. Um, so when we met, they were doing, cr- bringing the farm back from what it was like, it was actually a family farm of theirs from the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, and sixties. And they sold it. And my mother-in-law and my wife purchased it back in the early teens. Um, and then started renewing the farm back to farm status. Cause everything was overgrown. There's trees everywhere. It wasn't a farm for decades. So they got rid of all the trees, put in fencing, put in a wells, put in all the stuff for the ability to have sheep. Um, we got some cows, we got some chicken, stuff like that, waiting to get the sheep. And then we, um, me and my wife had a baby. So we actually put a pin in the sheep thing till my son gets old enough to where it's not, you know, it's so much, so hard to raise a child. Um, my wife wouldn't be able to run a farm and raise a child at the same time. So <laughs> she's been doing her thing without the sheep until my son gets old enough, which he's kind of there now. So we're probably looking at getting like 50 to a hundred sheep next year. And that's cool. going to be the main, main portion of the show. Yeah. It's funny. This is supposed to be a beer podcast. We always get like off topic. Yeah. So it's like, um, well, you know, like, beer's, beer's interesting, but the, you know, it's a people are interesting. So fun story. How did, how did you get into uh craft beer or just beer in general? Actually, I think we've kind of reached a point where we don't really need to say craft anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like um, if you're, if you're into beer, people know what you mean. Like you're not just a drunk on the corner. You know? <laughs> um, you know what? It, it, I, uh, it, it's, it's odd because we mentioned earlier in um in the review uh unibrew is actually what got me into beer mm-hmm. um so i was like you know i wasn't really into beer but i had a couple friends that were kind of like interested in beer i knew about them but that was like you know it wasn't a thing that i was really into and then i went to canada so i used to for 18 years i worked in the a body modification industry i actually did like body piercing and scarification and implants all kinds of weird stuff like that and uh, i used to be a, a, a consultant and admin for this website that was the epicenter for all that stuff and it was based out of toronto canada and every couple times a year we'd all go up there and do like a group meetup like kind of like a barbecue hangout kind of thing and meet and greet and all the people that work for the site and stuff like that. And the first time I went up there and this guy, Phil, I'm like, I heard you have great beer up here. By my means, I meant like Molson triple X. I didn't actually know what good beer was. This is probably 97, 96, something, somewhere around there. And he's like, Oh, let me take it to the beer store. For those that don't know, if you go to Canada, you go to the beer store. It's called the beer store. It looks like a Home Depot. It's got a orange sign that says the beer store. And it's basically <laughs> just a bunch of bottles on the wall. And you say, I'll get a case of that. And it comes out in the conveyor belt. And he's like, you'll like this one. So he got me a case of Unibrew Maudit. And um, I drank way too many of them over the course of three days. And uh, I was like, this is awesome. And then basically went back. And, and, and lucky enough, we're talking, you know, late 90s here, not like before the boom, I guess you would say, of craft beer. I happen to live down the street from, I would dare to say, one of the best small beer bars, probably on the East Coast, in, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Like, not like a big city. Like, they had, they had, I, I found a menu of theirs several years ago that I scanned. Mm-hmm. In 1997, Cantillon, Dre Fontaine, Thomas wow. Hardy. Like, like, that's what they had on like and everything they had Russian river. They had everything in 1990. You know what I mean? Wow. Like I was so lucky. And what happened was, and how I really got into beer was I went to this place. Cause my friend Ian worked there and I knew he worked there and I was like, okay, I'm like, go and see Ian. And you'll know. I'm like, do you have this beer? Unibrew Maudit. I'm like, I love this. He's like, actually we do. I was like, okay. I was like, can I have one? He's like, sure. You know, drank it and drank a bunch of those went home. Came back another day, drank a bunch of those, went home. Third time when he's like, he's like, don't you want to try something else? I was like, I like this. He's like, you should try something else. I was like, okay. Yeah. And then I was like, whatever. And then he eventually said, listen. He's like, yeah, obviously I like beer. He's like, I'll, I'll make a deal. He's like, I'll, I'll hook you up. 
He's like, I'll, I'll give you like mad discount on beer, but you can't drink it. You can ask, you can't drink what you want. I'm just going to give you a beer and you'll drink it. And he's like, but in exchange, he's like, I'll tell you everything about the beer. So I literally got like a, a master course, master class on beer from this guy who knows more about, forgot more about beer than I could probably remember mm-hmm. in the nineties, which is just right place, right time. What was the name of the bar? Elmer Suds. Elmer Suds. Sounds like Mahars. Did you ever go to Mahars? No, no. You're, you've heard of it though, or you know what I'm talking about? No, I've never heard it before. Um, well, Mahars was a kind of like a bar, just like you're talking about. It's in it was was in Midtown Albany. Um, that's funny. I was listening to your podcast in the car today, and like I, I guess you were just up in Albany last year for uh, Fiden's Brewing. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so Mahars was. It was, it was a little like English pub style and like they had this computer like you would put your your name in like because you got like a member number and it would print out a menu of all the beers that they have that you haven't had yet. And like every day you could have I think it was like a max of like four beers a day. So like when you when you go to the bar, like you would tell the bartender which beer you want and they would like cross it off your list. And then like you put it in a basket by the door when you leave. And when you come back next time, those beers aren't on your list. And like they, they had like kind of like a rewards program. So like after like fifty beers, you got a T-shirt, a hundred beers, you get like uh, a case of whatever beer you want, and then you get like eventually you get in the mug club where you can get, you get a mug and you get like beer for a discount. Yeah, no, we had a place like that when I lived in East in Pennsylvania. Yeah. It was a place called um, Porter's Pub, and it was the same thing. Like you would go in and like you'd sign in to your sheet. And basically they had like 101 beers. And if you drank through all 101 beers and you became part of the mug club and then you can go in there and pull your mug up down from the ceiling and be like, yeah. Hey, fill this up and you pay 20, 20% I less. I think even, I think world of beer has like a similar mm-hmm. thing too, but, but the Albany trip you're talking about where I was there not too long ago, that was actually the first time I've ever been to Albany. Um, mm-hmm. that actually went there for what, what about, we call beer tube a palooza, which is, um, I, I started a thing a couple of years ago where I invited, um, basically anybody within the area or whoever wanted to come to basically. Yeah. I saw that on your uh, reviews. Yeah. Your so we did it in Albany. Um, that one. Yeah, yeah. I used to host it here on my farm. Like if you see those pictures with the background with the, oh, yeah, that, yeah. that's my, that's my farm. But, um, but I, uh, I, uh, whatchamacallit i just with the family and the kid and, and the logistics around it, it just got a little bit too much for me to do so what we decided to do or what i decided to do was because kyle I was from no hype mm-hmm. yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> kyle's such a good dude um but um we um i decided i was like you know i can't really do this anymore on my own i'm like so how about all y'all like the original attendees there was like seven people i think mm-hmm. um and i'm like how about the original ent- we'll do it in each one of your towns moving forward for the next so you like someone will host it and someone will host it so kyle hosted it not this past year but the year before um actually a, a viewer of all of our channels who's a super good friend of ours he hosted it last year so i'm not sure where we're going to do it this year um but he, if you want to share your share the screen that i actually put down in uh down in here actually brought up that menu i was talking about of this place granted this is a menu for beers from 1997 um, if you look at this, I'm not sure if you could read it, but um, you have in here. Oh, those prices look like today's prices. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it, some of the stuff they have here, you know what I mean? J.W. Lee's, Fuller's, uh, you know what I mean? Six bucks for a bottle in a bar, mind you. You're not, you know what I mean? If yeah. you look in here, you have all these trap sales. Look at that. West Vedelin, 8 and 12 they had on off wow. over the bar. Like you could. Bur- yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Lambics. Uh, loggers. Um, I can't imagine they were importing these legally. <laughs> no, oh, 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 of course not. But back then, no one gave a shit. You know what I mean? Uh, Thomas Hardy Ale, 1998. So at this point, it's probably a couple years old. Seven bucks for a bottle. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. um, specialty you had a. Uh, uh, let's see, where, where's the? I thought there was. I thought KP Allen was on here for some. Oh, Sam Adams Triple Box, ten bucks a bottle. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah yeah schlenkeler they had schlenkeler back then which now you see a lot but you don't see so much nowadays but yeah it i just, didn't know the shoe foys around back then that's what i'm saying it's so crazy and that's their little elmer elmer suds logo mm-hmm. um yeah such a weird 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 world of beer mm-hmm. you know 
Oh man. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's how I got into beer. <laughs> so how did you like, what was the inspiration to start the YouTube channel? Uh, hubris, <laughs> I think is the correct word. Um, so I was always into beer, you know, um, I was coming, I was fresh off a, a long-term relationship, you know, I was like, into beer, I was kind of looking for an outlet for something to do. And, and I went to a beer share. Uh, so local, um, it's, I want to, so it's obviously like 19 or 2013 ish. And, um, you know, I watched beer tube, you know what I mean? I watched a couple of people on beer tube, stuff like that. And, um, and so I knew it existed. And then I went to this beer share. There was a local beer shop close to me called J and H beer and, um, nice little shop, mom and pop place, nothing too crazy. And they were like, Oh, we're going to have an in-house share here. You know, we're just going to, you know, come bring some stuff. We'll close and then hang out. And I met this guy named Joe, um, and good friend of mine to this day, we talk almost every day or two. And, um, we just started chatting younger kid, you know, he's, now I'm 48. He's probably in his mid to early 30s, you know, so he was young back then. And uh, he was like, I'm a home brewer and I, I do beer reviews on YouTube. I was like, oh, you do? So, you know, I checked him out and 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 not going to lie to you. I said, well, if this guy's doing beer reviews, then <laughs> I should be able to fucking do them. You know, total hubris. And I his, said, uh, What was his username on YouTube? Is it still around? Any, any, yes, there's, they should still be up there. N-E-P-A, so Northeastern Pennsylvania, but all one, you know, N-E-P-A beer reviews. N-E-P-A beer reviews? I think he might still be. I mean, he's a professional brewer now, so I don't know if he took them down. Uh, it's funny, I typed that in and like your channel is the first one that comes up. Yeah, he might have taken them down. Barley done a bunch. We yeah. did a bunch of collab reviews and stuff like that, but now he's a professional brewer. This dude. Um, that's yep, that's Joe. Um, that's me doing um reviewing his home brew at his house. Good God. Um, and that's him doing a brew day. Uh, me, uh, me and him hanging out doing a brew day and stuff like that. But uh yeah, now he's a pro, uh, pro brewer um for several years now and works currently works in a brewery called Levante Brewery. Yeah, it looks like he probably yeah. deleted his channel because uh this would be hyperlinked if he yeah 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 and he's like the funniest part is that like he's gonna be because he's been he's been professionally brewing for a while now he's worked at river horse he's worked mm -hmm. at a place called brotherton he's worked at uh, several different breweries and uh you know he's like he's uh for better or for worse he's gone on a couple interviews for jobs and they're like halfway through the interview they're like so you know that mac guy huh <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, dude. They're like, no, they're real, real nice. Victory was like, you so you know that Matt guy, yeah? I was like, I'm sorry. Did you get the job? <laughs> <laughs> what What was the inspiration for the name Massive? Uh, I went through several iterations of whatever, but um, I used to belong. I'm I'm wearing it right now. I used to belong to a website that did like a uh, columns on music, and it was <laughs> called uh, Huge Massive. Um, and I was like, you know, I really like massive. I'm like, I'm just going to do massive beer reviews. So I'm like, that mm -hmm. just makes sense. Cause at the time, honestly, um, you know, now I'm team low ABV back then. I, I just wanted to drink barley wine. So it's kind of yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. And like, it's funny cause you have a podcast that's called massive whoops with a, yeah, uh, no. with an F. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. W well, yeah. Cause I figured I'd, I'd make the podcast something a little bit different that way mm -hmm. when people searched it would just be a little bit different so i chose beer massive instead of massive beers so and plus massive, like, massive mass means massive means mountain so it's beer uh -huh. mountain yeah or or like i know there's like a type of dog called like a mastiff like a bull mastiff yep. or whatever mm -hmm. like some really big dogs mm -hmm. but that was um the podcast is actually a, a friend of mine had a radio show again in northeastern pennsylvania it was pretty had a really good following and all the episodes are actually syndicated on the podcast mm -hmm. now uh, it was called beer geek radio hour um and it was based out of northeast pennsylvania and it was a terrestrial radio show so like at noon on sunday we'd have to go to the radio station sit down and we do an interview with the brewer basically the shtick was a brewer would send us beers and then um they'd call in during the middle segment which is 15 minutes long we interview them drink their beers and then the last like 10 minutes would be like you know just us wrapping up the show and stuff like that and it was a really cool experience got to interview like everybody 
it was really cool. And a lot of it was due to the access that my friend started the show and I took it over eventually, but he, he just, he was really good at booking people. And, uh, we did everybody from Jim Koch to, you know, Dean from Trillium to, you know, I mean, everybody in the industry and it was really fun. Um, but the podcast end of things came from just radio sucked because you had mm -hmm. to, well, no, I had to be at the same place on a Sunday every day, every every week at noon. You had to go I like had to into be, a radio studio. Yeah, I had to go sit in a radio studio. You had to be there at noon. You know what I mean? You had to coordinate everything for noon. So it was just a little. It just got to be too much. And honestly, I think I stopped doing that right around 2016, mm -hmm. 17 maybe. Um, and that's kind of when podcasting was not taking so, off. Yeah. It's starting to really gain momentum. I'm like, it just makes more sense to turn it into a podcast. So. Anyway. Have you just been doing it from home since then? No, no. Um, the 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 sticking point for me was to actually do it almost always in person. Um, mm -hmm. So almost all the podcasts that I did, and there was exceptions to the rule, especially during pandemic times, you know. Um, but before that, it was always in person. It had to be in person. That was kind of my, my own little little personal like thing. So I traveled and just traveled, you know, mostly uh, almost all of this in the Northeastern. United yeah. States. It's, that, yeah. When you're in the Northeast corner of the USA, it's like you're New York, New Jersey, all the new England States are like within a day's drive. Yeah. You but know, you know, and ended up getting some really cool guests. You know what I mean? Like I sat, my favorite I've done to this date is John Kimmich from the alchemist. That was probably the funnest podcast I've ever done. Uh, yeah, I was, scro I was scrolling it. through it today. I'm gonna download that one, and I just I see last summer you did one with uh, Peter, the Master of Hoppets. Yeah, that was so, uh, a YouTube based one. That was remote. Obviously, we didn't hook up in real life. Uh, um, yeah. That was when you I was and I actually to do met them. in person. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was uh, when he was going to college in uh, Arizona, was it Colorado, or Arizona, or something. Yeah, I remember. I it was, or it was either Arizona or New Mexico. One of those. Okay. And we, and we met at JFK Airport and we just like did a beer review in my car in the parking garage. That's fantastic. It's actually one of my favorite reviews. It was a uh, the Three Floyds uh Amon Amarth uh Porter. I remember because yeah. like, we did these plastic cups because I didn't want to bring glass <laughs> in the car with me. <laughs> he's such a good dude, you know, positive, yeah. nice, now, you know, just... yeah, he's a pro brewer now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is Are a you, kind uh, of unique twist because he's a pro brewer and he still reviews. So that's kind of a unique, yeah. you know, angle. Do you do home brewing? No, I've or, I've 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 home brewed before, but I'm not. I would never call myself a home brewer. Mm -hmm. Some you people like to drive the race cars. Some people like to drive the race cars. Some people like to make the race car. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been a while. I, honestly, the last time I brewed, well, you know, I've helped out. I've done help, I've done brew days at breweries before where it's like, you know, I'm there, hey, you want to find that's whatever, but that's different. Like last time I did like homebrew was probably with my buddy Joe, um, in between stints or something like that of him doing pro stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to homebrew all the time when I lived in Albany. I actually won a bunch of awards too. And then when I moved to Florida, um, I found that like my batches kept getting infected. It was really gross. And the I only made thing like or a, something humidity thing, or that's that's what I was thinking because uh, a friend of mine who was a pro brewer, um, you know, she was saying it's just like the humidity, probably like the bacteria just kind of stays in the air more. Or I mean, because yeah. I like I always sanitize this the heck out of all my equipment, you know. Um, I did make a really good Brett Saison, which was something I didn't, didn't even plan on doing. I got like these lip top i think they were like mead bottles you ever seen like those mead bottles are probably like but they're really tall but they're skinny so yeah they're, they're, like, they're, they're like they're faux stone yeah. those ones you're talking about like that the i know i know what you're talking yeah about. like they're only like 500 mil if that but like they were like really tall um i got like a bunch of used ones off somebody and they must have brett in them so like i would make like like if you're if you live in florida basically just use saison yeast for like everything because the saison yeast likes it warm and i would just do like saisons and i would like and then they would pick up like a little brett character inside these swing top bottles and um i don't know but i i, I stopped doing that probably about seven years ago and 
I mean, as much fun as it was, like, I think, like, because I live, in, I've always lived in apartments. Although when I lived in Albany, it was like a house that was converted into apartments. Like, I still had like a backyard. I still had like a garden hose and all that. And I don't mm -hmm. have access to that here because I'm just like in a complex. And it's also like, I have like so much beer, you know, <laughs> like I'm buying like yeah. so much beer. Like, I don't have time to drink homebrew on top of this. Much let alone go to like homebrew club meetings and all that. And it's just, yeah, there's you know. just so much into it. And, and the older you get, like everything in life, man, you got to prune that tree of the stuff you're interested in because you don't have the time. You know yeah. what I mean? And like something's got to go. But as far as the back, uh, the brewing, uh, off brewing homebrew stuff, I'll ask my friend. Um, he's a, he's a pro brewer. He actually works at a brewery in Florida. Um, mm. oddly enough, he was actually started off as a viewer of the channel. Um, he is, it's a really cool story. He, he, he wrote me a couple of times, like outside of comments being like, you know, I, I watched this years ago. Yeah. I watched the show. I really dig it. And he's like, can I send you some beer? And the first beer mail he sent me was a bunch of beer from a brewery that he is now head brewer at before he was even a brewer. Like he was just like, watch YouTube channel and went from sending me beers from this brewery. Now he's the head brewer there, which is pretty What's awesome. The name? What's the name Barrel of the Monks? Barrel of Monks. Sounds familiar. What you know what city it's in? A Boca Raton. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty far yeah. from there. We we actually get distro of their stuff up here. That's how hmm. big they are. They're they're decent size enough to where you know it's funny. Stuff up here like now. where I live, like so I'm like halfway between Orlando and Daytona Beach. And like the beer selects around here sucks. Like the closest you can get is like total wine. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of like these um like they're bottle shop slash bars so it's like they have like coolers kind of like this but it's like if you open the can or the bottle there and drink it there they charge like a two or three dollar uncorking fee mm, or if you get sucks. the beer to go it's like whatever that price is you know and um so that's why i get most of my beer on tavor link in the description ten dollars off of my code <laughs> um you know, because like I get a lot of stuff that like you just can't get around here, and it's a lot mm -hmm. of it is like, although a lot of it's like really overpriced or really expensive. Um, I'm trying to think, like, uh, well, actually, like uh, Rice Krispie Boy. This one's actually from Westbrook, but you wouldn't think okay. you wouldn't think so from the label. You know, yeah, Westbrook Brewing. I don't know. There's like this this trend now of uh, 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 craft breweries making rice lagers. Yeah, yeah. Which it's is essentially thing, Budweiser. Yeah. Mm. But I have some interesting ones, though. I've had you know some interesting takes on a rice lager from American mm. breweries because they take liberties with it. But you know they usually lean heavily into like an Asian theme. Like I've had you know um, flour based. You mm -hmm. know, stuff, um, you know, flower, floral, dosed, floral, uh, conditioned on flowers, kind of rice lagers and uzu and stuff like that. But um, as far as distro stuff where I am, I'm, I'm, I'm rather lucky. I'm, you know, 20 minutes max away from Pennsylvania. I live in New Jersey and I'm 40 yeah. minutes away from New York. So I have three states I can pick beers from, you know. Yeah. And and don't know it, Jersey and Pennsylvania. Don't New Jersey and Pennsylvania have like so like a lot of archaic beer laws? Like you can't buy singles or like the store hat like it like you can only get it from a bar, but it's always like a bar on one side of the building and like a yeah. store on the other side of the building. Yeah, in Pennsylvania, it, it, a lot of the laws have been expunged, but the one stupidest law ever is in Pennsylvania, which is you're only allowed to purchase unless it's a distributor. If you purchase anything from a non-distributor, so that's a supermarket. A mm -hmm. beer store that's not a distributor, a brewery, doesn't matter. You can only take out 192 ounces of liquid at one time. So, like, <laughs> if I go to Wegmans and if I wanted to buy a 12-pack of beer uh -huh. in two four-packs, I couldn't I couldn't do that. I could buy the 12-pack in one four or 12-pack, buy it, mm -hmm. take it, put it in my car, walk back in, buy those other two four-packs, and then go to my car. I just yeah. can't do it all at one time. Yeah, it's so um, dumb. Or like and like then, you couldn't go to another store yeah, too, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and in New Jersey is not so much beer purchasing because it's it's actually New Jersey's quite ripe with weird, awesome old beer. Like you can go in a place and find like, oh, <laughs> there's a Chimay from 20 years ago. 
for a dollar because it's on discount. Like that's, <laughs> it happens all the time in New Jersey. I find aged beer like insane. Like I'll find old dogfish heads from like 15 years ago and good stuff too. The stuff that ages well. But um, the oh. the problem with brewer, the problem with brewery, uh, New Jersey is the brewery loss. Um, they're not like a they're ham, hamstrung quite a crazy. Yeah. Like they're not. Didn't they're not they allowed just, to show sports uh, and all that stuff. Didn't they just allow but, self distribution? I thought I no, saw they've they've, they've they've allowed self distribution for quite some time. It's been more so like at a, the brewery, like they can't serve food at a brewery. It's illegal to serve food at a brewery. It's illegal mm -hmm. to have like more than like a couple events and events being music or whatever. Now all that's changing. It's taking time to change, but it's going for the better. But it's been very very weird. Like you yeah. can go to a brewery and like you up until a couple months ago, you had to take a tour of the brewery. <laughs> like you would go there and they'd be like, okay, you got to go on this 15 minute tour before you can drink anything. You're not allowed really? to even. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's funny that you were talking about the old beer. And I've said this on every episode of this podcast. So if you haven't seen it um, or if you have, so there's this liquor store within walking distance of my apartment and it's a, it's literally a liquor store and like they have this huge walk-in cooler it's like the size of like my living room or probably like the size of your shed there. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a refrigerated beer cooler. And you would think like that would be awesome, but it's not. Cause like all the beer that's in there is like these bottles and cans from like two or three or four years ago or more. Like I call it the beer museum. Cause like you walk <laughs> in there and it's like, here's what people were drinking like 10 years ago. Like there's a, they still have, I swear to God, they still have like probably at least a half dozen bottles of Founders CBS in the 750 mil from 2017, still sitting on the shelf from 2017, still at that same price. They also have uh, the brewery Taru, and like mm -hmm. it'll say it says like in big letters right on the label 2016. And I've, I've brought it to the clerk and be like, "Hey, can you discount this? This beer is like you know eight years old," and the dude's like, "Like." unless the owner's right there, they, they're like, I can give you like a dollar off or something or, you know, or like they'll have like, it, like you would hope like it would, it would be like, you know, dogfish worldwide stout or 120 or um, maybe like a Chimay blue or Rochefort 12, something like that, where something that actually ages. Although actually they do have a bunch of goose Island bourbon counties, just the regular, not the variants. Mm -hmm going all the way back to like 2018 and again it's not because they're hoarding it it's because it just sits on the shelf and it's like this isn't a beer store i would assume like 90 percent of their sales are from liquor you know yeah <laughs> well and new jersey like the weird part about it was is that like some of the bigger you know if you look up distribution uh import importer slash mm -hmm. distribution in the united states a lot of it now is like um company called be united shelton brothers still exists there's merchant divin there's a couple different big ones but they used to be a bunch of smaller ones and a bulk of them were in new jersey so a lot of like belgian a lot of like what i would consider perfectly ageable beer which is basically core four bottle condition is kind of like your perfect mm -hmm. recipe for that so you find a lot of those beers here same thing with bourbon County. i picked i have my fridge right now i have a 2018 bourbon county i picked up this two days ago from a place that had four cases on the shelf in the cases too. They weren't even like out. And I just pulled one out and I said, what do you want for this? And the guy's like, uh, 10 bucks. I was like, sure. <laughs> Why not? You know what I mean? Like, and yeah. that's the way it is in New Jersey, like all over the place. So we're very lucky out here to find like good ageable old beer. I mean, not a lot of people age beer. That's not. Yeah. It. Urban um, County will age. That's, that's a good one. Especially to especially post what 16. Now it's past dry. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it, it can, it's not going to age as well, but mm -hmm. still age is good. Or uh, I like the uh, the Belgian quads, like with a little bit of age on them. Belgian quads, English barley wine. Oh yeah, two best two best agers of all time. Old North Coast Old Stock, JW's Harvestdale, Thomas Hardy Ale. You know those. Yeah, I love uh, yeah. JW Lee's. That was always one of my favorites. Yeah, I love that beer so much. And that one's just like it's like carbonated caramel or butterscotch yeah. or something. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's probably a billion calories per bottle, mm. but I don't care. Yeah. Uh, do you use Untapped? Do you keep track of like every single beer you check into? Or not really. Um, no, no. I, I mean, I used to, you know, back in the day, like everybody else had an Excel sheet, you know, 
with everything in it. And, you know, once the tap came around, I kind of, before I, I, I opened an account on tap and basically transferred my whole Excel sheet to tap. So I didn't like bombard somebody's feed. And that was when it first came out. And then I used it on and off sparingly. Um, but I, I, last time I've really used it, like really used it, it was probably about like four or five years ago. Really? So I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't use it at all, really. Do you um, have a, I, a really good memory? <laughs> well, that's the thing, though. So I think it's not so much that I'm trying to keep track of beers. How do I put it? If I pick up a beer, I'm, I'm going to remember if I've had it before, most more often than not. But I think the question is whether it's good or not. Mm -hmm. And if I if I go, I know I've had this, and I can't remember if it was really good, then it wasn't really good. There's no way it was really good because I would remember if it was really, really good. So that's kind of how I gauge it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care about tracking every beer I've ever had. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, it's nice to remember the ones that I've had. But I also, you know, at the end of the year, I do my, you know, best of. So I have, like, some kind of ongoing See, list I'm of what I think was fantastic. I'm kind of the opposite of you like that. It's like, I have like a terrible memory. So there's plenty of beers where that's why I like, I check into everything on untap and I'm at the beer store and I'll scan I'll like, I'll pick up the beer and I'll be like, I remember having this, but I can't remember if I liked it or not. And I'll scan the barcode and sure enough, I'll look it up on untap and be like, wow, this beer was awesome. Or wow, this beer was terrible. You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So I, I use untapped. Maybe I want to say maybe about a year ago, I started just posting stuff on Untapped whenever I do a beer review just for to promote the channel and stuff like that. Not mm -hmm. really uh, for whatever, but like the last thing I posted on Untapped was August 30th, 2023. And that was, like I said, I went through a stretch of time where I was posting stuff. So, it, so I, about a month or two, I probably posted semi regularly. And then, so <laughs> if I go back to, if I, if I skip that little, little session where I was doing stuff in 2023 for a month or two is 2009, mm -hmm. 2019 was the last mm -hmm. time I posted. So. Do you read any, uh, beer books or yeah. beer blogs? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I read, you know, the classics, uh, beer book wise, I actually, oddly enough doing YouTube, um, I actually don't like video as a as a consumer as <laughs> fat orange oh, guy. Again. Um I don't like YouTube as a source of information. I, I even though that's what I use bulk of the time. I, I prefer podcasts mm -hmm. um and I prefer prefer reading. Um so you know um you know I'll, I'll I used to have subscriptions to some of the magazines, you know, beer advocate used to send me stuff all about beer magazine, which is now back. Or no, yeah, which is now back now. Um, stuff like that. I would read. I read a lot of articles randomly. Uh, I have a couple of friends that are uh, beer journalists that send me stuff, mm -hmm. and then um, and then uh, just you know podcasts. Podcasts are probably my major like it's in funny. intake. Like, what's the? Can you record? Because I only re I only listen to a couple beer podcasts. The problem is like you would think like beer and podcasting would go, and I just find like. Cause I've like most of the podcasts are like interviews with pro brewers and like pro brewers. It, it's not like the Joe Rogan show where like the people are like inherently interesting or funny, you know? And uh, like, yeah, there's then, like a lot of, but it's not, but they, they're talking to Joe Rogan. He's a human yeah. piece of garbage. So why would you want to listen to that to begin with? But eh. um, <laughs> Rogan's awesome. He's horrible. He's like one of the worst people in the universe. Why you say that? Because he's a crazy wackadoo like Elon Musk and all those crazy people that spout lies and bullshit and just like wow. just get a, make money off people and being idiots. <laughs> well, I don't think I don't think you've actually watched them, but anyway, what I was gonna say was I've, I've listened to him. I, I've listened to hundreds of hours of his stuff. I know I know yeah. my enemy. I know my enemy. <clears throat> all right. So I was gonna say, have you read this book, The Beer Geek Handbook? from patrick I dawson i have not this uh, this one i think you would really like it's almost like you wrote it or like i wrote it because it's kind of like it's about like bottle shares um like brewery tours and stuff like that like archaic laws um friending the it, 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 there's actually a story in here of like how 
you should friend like the bartender at the craft beer bar or like at the beer store, you know? Um, yeah. Like it even says, I don't know if you can see this on the back, train your local beer guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I mean, that, that makes sense. You know, like that's actually what I tell everybody. You know, I have people write me, you know, semi-regularly, Oh, I'm going to this location. What should I do? Where should I go beer wise? And I'm like, I always tell them, I'm like, go to a brewery that you think is good and ask them where to go. You know what I mean? Like that's, they're the people they live there. They know what's, what's good. And you know what I mean? You're going to find the places that know, you know, if you go on an online forum and you ask people, it's like, Oh, I'm going to New York city. Where should I go? And everybody's going to be like, I got another half. Oh, you got to go to a Finback. You got to go to, yeah. da, 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 da. but then they're like, if you go to Finback or other half and you talk to partner and be like, where should I go? They'll be like, mm, you should go to this place. Cause that's where I go after work. That's the places I want to go. Yeah. Like I, I was going to say, like, where do you get your, like, wh where's your fingers on the pulse of like, what's like the it brewery of the moment? Like, um, like for, I mean, I remember for like a while there, it was uh hill farmstead and then it was Treehouse, And I guess now it's equilibrium and other half. Like what's like, how do you hear about like the next brewery, like to blow up like that? You got to try. Uh, just podcast I don't know. or I, I I don't know. Uh, just talking to friends, I guess. You know, like I, you know, you know, that's the thing, though. Like I think a lot of the times, like you know, if you if you go through the Michelin guide for restaurants, you're just gonna get the best mm -hmm. of the best of the best. A lot of times, you want to go to the place before the best of the best. They're the best of the best. They're just not announced and uh, you know pronounced or anointed the best of the best of the best so it's just yeah. it, it, honestly it's drinking beer and talking to people in the industry you know like you know i'm lucky enough to have friends that are brewers that have friends that are journalists that have a lot of friends that are beer enthusiasts genuine friends you know like like through my through the channel the like the coolest thing about like my channel is like i've met so many cool people like i've had uh, i've there's two people who at my wedding who were started off as commenters on my videos <laughs> like that you know i've made genuine like friends yeah that I, I i i you know through the channel you know what i mean so you know having all these people that are enthusiastic about beer and really enjoy good things and they'll just be like man i've had this you know i talked to, well i have a group chat with several different beer tubers to where we're constantly just chatting about stuff or um you know talking to people and it's just finding different things you know and just communicating with different people it's not so much it's a singular podcast um and honestly just trying different stuff and doing basically what i just said like i'll go you know i'll mm -hmm. drive to a certain location and i'll sit down at a bar and more often than not when i go to a brewery or whatever i just sit in the corner and i play on my phone and i drink a couple of beers and, and chat up the bartender and, and they'll be like man i had this food. i'll be like hey have you had anything good lately you know and they'll be like man i had this really good beer in this brewery yeah. like, i have never heard of them before they're I'll be like, you know, put a little mental note down and be like, hmm, maybe I should check them out. That's kind of how it works more often than not for me. Um, Do you consider yourself a beer snob? Like, um, no. <laughs> no, no, like you can. Can you appreciate the uh, 3.5 English mild as much as like the 8.7 double IPA or something like that? I hate double IPAs. <laughs> that might not. That might uh. Uh, no, I guess I am a beer snob, you know. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, anything that is like, like, do with big money or macro beer or anything like that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if it's brewed by big beer, I'm just not gonna drink it because <laughs> I think big beer is bullshit. And I think, uh, yeah, anybody who drinks anything that is born by a corporation is a shill. Yeah, I used to be like that too. And then <laughs> I actually like got my BJCP certification and like I I realized oh like how hard it is to actually and especially home brewing, like what goes into brewing beer. And like you start to taste like those nuances and stuff. So it's like like my friend Jay from Jay's beer review. I don't know if you ever watched him or not, but like and he still kind of is a beer snob. Like he he lives up in upstate New York and like he makes treks to Hill Farmstead a couple of times a year. And, and he's just like, you know, Hill Farm said, oh, is there so much? They blow Treehouse out of the water. You know, I'm like, these are two breweries I can't get. But it's like somehow I know I like their reputation is like they're supposed to be like the two greatest breweries in the country or whatever. 
Um, and they make like the same two beers, you know, like Imperial Stouts and Hazy IPAs and stuff, you know. Um, no, no, but to, to answer your question, no. Um, like, uh, like I'm drinking a Miller High Life. That was the mm. point of the joke, you know. But um, I, you know, I don't care. I don't care about it because I, what do I? I don't want to yuck somebody else's yum. And if mm-hmm. they find that thing that that that's great, then then have at it. If you think Zima or goddamn Zima seltzers um, or whatever, do you do you? You know what I mean? It's it's my issue is probably the opposite. Uh, Anti beer snob. It's when someone's like, "Fuck that." I'm sorry if this is G <laughs> rated. Um, screw that. That's not. That's dumb. I hate that. Like when it comes to slushy beers or hazies and stuff like that, I'd be like, sure, a lot of these like slushy kettle sour beers packed with fruit juice and stuff, they're not necessarily beer, but they're very tasty beverages. Um, it's, it, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where I'm like, I don't care. I always, yeah. I always, I always make it. So the point I make, if you're going to make a list of your 10 favorite movies, okay, that you've ever seen in your life, how many of those do you think would be comedies? half yeah a lot how many comedies have won the oscar i know exactly zero so just because something's awesome doesn't count mean any hall to... yeah it's, it's one of those things where it's just because you like it it doesn't it it doesn't have to be like the 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 the, the mary webster dictionary definition of what beer may be you mm-hmm. know what i mean and if you will enjoy it enjoy it it's just that when someone's very specific about like this is what the, my opinion is this and this is my opinion, and that's the only thing that matters. Yeah, and it's written in a rule book and all those things. Yeah, you know, Michael Jackson wasn't a BJCP judge. Pat Paisley and doesn't have cis around. I was well, gonna you're gonna add. say they're you're gonna say they're invalid. You know what I mean? You, you're gonna say well, they don't have those certifications, so they're invalid. Yeah. Do you, no. are you BJCP or cis around? No. no. Any interest no. in it? No. no. I mean, honestly, from a BJCP, not so much. You know, I've I've done a, a beer judging before. I don't need that certification to tell me what I know. Mm. And that's fine. And I understand that for me, BJCP is more of a guideline and a, and a, and a tenant for homebrewers more than anything else. That's how I, I view it. And I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying that's how I view it. Cicerone for me is super interesting from a challenging standpoint, because I think, you know, the only, like, it's like, you know, to me, Cicerone is almost like a contest. It's almost like a reality show to a certain extent, um, because there's a there's a definite um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a there. It exists for a reason, and the reason exists is a good thing. But I think between your server slash advanced section, which is more education for people in the industry, to the top level, it's a different ball game. Like it's it's almost like a sommelier, ultra sommelier thing, to where it's like, okay, well, I can learn the cicerone, I can get the cicerone, and that's great at lower levels, like the advanced or whatever. So now there's, I think there's another tier in there between whatever. Anyway, going and elevating towards the tippy top is like like a, like a contest, and it's just people mm-hmm. want to win the contest. It's actually not, an, uh, it can serve you well in the in the beer world, but it's more of like can I accomplish this kind of thing rather than, I don't know, applicable towards whatever, you know, but it, I, it makes sense for a certain extent, you know, clean yeah. draft lines, know how to taste beer, know what all flavors are. Take a, yeah, test. a lot of the B or a lot of the Cicerone it is based on the BJCP. Like they use the BJ, BJCP style guidelines for their style guidelines, but it's also, I mean, I, Darwin could speak better to this, than me because I'm, I'm only a beer server and not a cicerone but it's like cicerone's meant more for people who like work in the industry and like you said bjcp is more for homebrew but it's like those style guidelines are like still what they use like beer connoisseur magazine still bit like bases their scores on the bjcp guidelines and uh like i know the um but do you think beer connoisseur bases their their ratings off of bjcp because because that's valid in today's world or is that's how they always done it you know what i mean because i think it's we, I think it's just we, like evolve, it's we evolve and new information comes to site and then you know we, we evolve as a humanity and we start 
understanding things differently and and pro- it's, it's like beer kind of sort has been basically doing the same same thing since what 70s do you know what, right how long have you been sure. around you know what i mean so it's one I of those things like, about beer magazine so no I, I, all about beer yeah i forget anyway semantics but um but I agree that like be but Cicerone, well, we'll we'll find out because they just sold the whole company. So who knows what the company's gonna turn into now? That really basically yeah, yeah. They sold I haven't heard about they, that. Yeah, the creators of Cicerone sold the company. Um, so I don't know who Not owns it. What they're, there, I hope. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you know what? They're, you know who has most master Cicerones in their employee? Budweiser. ABI, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean they're also like so, the biggest brewery conglomerate though yeah. too they probably yeah. have so it's employees. like i'm not insinuating that cicerone's going to turn some weird thing but when someone buys something they have more often than not there's a profit to it mm-hmm. why would they buy it so i don't know how it's going to change but yeah i think it was like last month it just happened where really the, I'll have to look the that creators up. yeah yeah where do you go for your beer news it's predominantly instagram and twitter I have a, uh, I have a Google News alerts. I used to have it daily, but it was like I was just getting like there was like way too much. <laughs> there was way too much news, so I changed it to weekly. So that's where I get uh, my okay. beer news from. I was gonna start yeah, a so- podcast where I like I went over the beer news of the week, but I would need like a permanent co-host, and trying to find a co-host is really hard, and trying to schedule a certain date and time is really hard. You know, it's probably a it's probably a combination of several things. Like I belong, like um. Like I belong to a, a ton of like, you know, Brewers Association, all the distributors, um, emails and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Like you get emails telling you about products that are coming in, samples are sending out. Oh, do you want this? Do you want that? You know, like all that and email that just kind of lets you know what's going on that way. Then Instagram is more for, you know, trends and what's going on with beer and a little bit more of the social media side of things where it's like, you know, influencers or beer tubers or journalists, stuff like that. Twitter is probably a little bit more heavy beer centric journalism, even though Twitter sucks horribly since it was purchased by that guy. But (laughs) it's like, it's, 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 it's horrible. It's like a crazy mess, but if you if you follow the right people in there, you know the people that I typically like to read. Um, you know whether it be, you know, uh, 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 Bernstein or uh, oh yeah, Josh Bernstein. Yeah, about Josh Bernstein and like you know John Hall and like all those people that are kind of like not old school beer journalists but new school old school beer journalists and stuff that like you can get stuff that way. And honestly, just conversation. A lot of it's just yeah. conversation online with people and stuff like that. So after 4,419 reviews, are there any beers still left on your bucket list or have you had everything oh, that no. you ever wanted to have? No, there's a ton of stuff on, on the list, you know, like I've, you know, I've never had plenty of younger, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, I've never had specific, I have one specific beer I will drink before I die. It's a bucket list beer that I want to drink. And it's, it's basically, it's, um, my favorite beer, if you say, what's your favorite beer? It's Tom Sardi Ale. That's my favorite beer of all time. And I want to drink a 1976 when I was born, Tom Sardi Ale. That's, that's my bucket list beer. That's my, okay, I drank it. I'm good. That's end of it. That's, a, so much. that's a British beer, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah, no, actually, Tom Sar- Thomas Sardi Ale is the, um, the beer that will not die. Uh, it's an <laughs> English, well, they call it an old ale, but it's an, it's, it's an English uh, okay, yeah. wine. Um, uh, and it's been bought and sold several times like it's like it's basically been produced someone dropped it and then someone bought the recipe and produced it and dropped it someone bought the recipe produced it dropped it that timeline went from the 60s to 2008 and then in 2016 um a a a brewery didn't buy it an actual distribution um company out of italy called inbev that has nothing to do with AB InBev. Um, purchased the recipe and started brewing it again in 2016. So now it's back. Um, mm. So it's, but you can still find vintages of it um, all over the place. So that that'd be my number one bucket list, basically because I want I drink a beer from when I was born. <laughs> yeah. What's the what's the worst beer you've ever had? Hmm. 
I that's so hard to answer because it's a hard the, question. Go ahead. You had Budweiser and Clamato Chilada. That one was pretty bad. Well, that's not beer, dude. Come on. That's yeah, I guess beer. it's basically a cocktail, but <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hard because like the worst beer I've ever had, honestly, I'm not gonna lie to you. It's probably local small brewery stuff. Um, only because like there's a difference between a beer that's turned sideways that is infected or wrong. Yeah. And then there's you made really shitty beer. There's a big difference between those two things. So if I'm thinking you made really shitty beer, it's probably like just some local place that is starting to cut their teeth and can't dump a batch kind of thing. And the yeah. general public doesn't know enough to know it sucks. It's probably one of those, you know, because anything that makes it to market more often than not is not going to be horrific. So it's probably something in some local mom and pop. I, I'm a home brewer and I turn open a brewery yeah. but don't know how to make beer kind of place. I know most like bad beer is just like due to like infection or poor sanitation or both, you know, like as long as like you follow a recipe, right? Like and it's not like, you know, have butric acid or, you know, the yeast autolyze or whatever, um, a diacetyl bomb or something like that. You know, like that's brewing is like a chemistry and mm -hmm. it's just like, you just need to know to, uh, like a little bit of like chemistry oh. and microbiology. No, what? you know what? I think I found the answer. I know the worst beer I've ever had. I actually just dawned on me. I'll see if I can bring it up real quick. There was a brewery out of, and this came out of a bottle too. Um, let's see if I can find it. This beer was so bad. <laughs> I can't even tell you. It tasted like, and and this is not me being like, whatever. There was a brewery out of Pennsylvania called Soul S O L E. Um, they ended up changing their name to, um, is this it? Oh my god, this is it. They ended up changing their name to. To separatists. Mm -hmm. Let me share this. Uh, okay. This is the worst beer I ever had. It's a beer called Floating World. Um, it was by Soul Artist Nails, and they changed it into the Separatist Beer Project. It was a farmhouse sale. Was no, it expired not, or this is not hyperbole. This uh -huh. is not your joke. It tasted like stomach bile. Yeah, probably uh autolyzed or butric acid. Yeah, butric acid is has like that um yeah, baby sick kind of flavor to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and and it, it it looked the part too, man. Like it, it just, it, it was just, man, this thing was hot garbage, like <laughs> hottest of hottest. The brewery doesn't exist anymore. So I'm not like pooping on anybody's whatever. You know what I mean? Like they, they've, they've folded for obvious reasons, but you went on I, about, it's funny. That was a bad beer, but you went on for 17 minutes. <laughs> oh man, dude, nothing gets me all excited and hot and bothered more than something bad beer. that sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, this trying is to great. Find, uh, um, that's boring. <laughs> there's all these pickle sours now. Have you ever had any of these? I haven't had pickle sours, but I had a bunch of pickled beers. Um, there's a really great brewery in the Midwest called The Steel. Mm -hmm. um, they sent me um, a, a four pack of there. They had a spicy dill pickle beer. It was really good. Like, really good. Like, um, it was like a jalapeno pickle beer uh i don't know if it was an ale lager but they sent it to me and it was right before one of the beer tube loses so i actually brought it up there as a mystery beer so i i you know had everybody drink it not knowing what it was um and people are like obviously this is a pickle beer obviously it's weird but obviously it's delicious so they could be really good but <laughs> as far as like a like a genuine sour pickle one i don't know if i've had that hmm 
Yeah, I've seen a few on uh, Tavor. I've just never pulled the trigger on it. I'm like, yeah, it just sounds kind of gross. I had, a, I had one the other day that was a peanut butter and jelly sour, but it wasn't really that sour at all. But it actually did taste like actual strawberry jam and actual peanuts. It was from it was from Microphone Brewing. Yeah, yeah, out of Chicago. Yeah. Um, this one. Okay. What's you your trick of getting the labels off? Do you just peel them off or do you like fill the can full of hot water? No, yeah, I just peel them off as long as it's just like a sticker on a can. Yeah. Pretty easy. It's a lot easier when the can's full. The one, the one thing that's unfortunate for me is uh, there's a certain kind of beer I can't drink anymore that I love. I've become allergic to a specific beer and I don't know why. And I've been working with the local brewery to try to figure out what it is, and still don't mm -hmm. know why. So that kind of sucks. Photo age like beers. Photo age beers. Oh, I think it's a. I think it's a yeast or a bacteria in a beer, and it's only a. But that's the thing. Like if I drink a photo age beer from, like for example, we have a couple of different breweries around here do photo stuff. There's a brewery called Dramlins, which is just in New York, just across the border. If I drink their photo stuff, I'm good. Zero problem. If I drink the photo stuff from that bond place brewing that I talked about earlier, if I drink their photo aid stuff, I have an like not anaphylactic level reaction, but I have an allergic reaction to it where I have to take a bunch of yeah, it must have some kind of bacteria in it or something. Yeah, it's gotta be specific because it's a photo, so who knows? You know what I mean? Like they're like a, almost like a petri dish of stuff. So I always thought it was pronounced food or I remember going to like the beer bloggers conference a few years ago when it was in Tampa and they had somebody from Petrus over. And he was talking about like aging the beer and the fooders, but he also had like a Dutch accent or Belgian accent or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm 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 team I'm team mispronunciation, baby. I don't <laughs> I, I I put zero I put zero care into enunciation. Like I actually kind of sometimes I pronounce stuff wrong just on purpose just to get people to freak out. Cool. You know what I hate when people say I can't stand it when people say double, like when a, it's a Belgian double. So I constantly uh -oh. just say double and people freak out. Oh, I thought you meant double, like D U V E. No, not no. Belgian. No, I wouldn't like to me it's like a thing where like like if I lived in England, I'd call binoculars binoculars. But if I live in the United States, I'll call them binoculars. So if I have a double over here, I'm not gonna say double. So it's a little bit weird. Like privacy. <laughs> yeah. Aluminium, even though that one doesn't count because it has an extra letter in schedule. Yeah. There we go. We'll talk about yeah. schedule. Well, we're going pretty long. So, uh, anything you want to talk before we wrap it up here? Any hot topics? Let me think. No, not really, man. Um, you know, like I said, like I appreciate you having me on, and yeah, it was fun. And you know, like uh, hopefully, people, you know, will go check out the review we did. That would be nice because I was actually pleasantly yeah. surprised. And con by that. congratulations on ten years. Thank you. Without a and then off. what's, well, let me ask you, let me yeah. ask you some questions. What's your, cause I know you've done beer tube for quite some time and some, and you've kind of like quit a couple of times. Like what keeps making you come back? Uh, cause I don't have anything else to do. <laughs> no, it's just, dude, it's kind perfect of perfect answer. Challenge. Perfect answer. Cause that's the truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, to me, it's like the challenge of like trying to like start over from the like you know from the beginning essentially trying to like build the audience back up trying to like like oh i got surpassed by all these new new kids you know kind of like a an old rocker coming out of retirement you know like oh i'll show mm -hmm. you who's the you know the flavor of the month or whatever but um i mean i just enjoy it but i mean i think it's just like for me it's like anything if i just do it a long enough too many times i just kind of get bored with it and um like currently, like I'm trying to like, like, it's funny. Like I have more subscribers now than I ever had. Like, you know, I, I wish I was on Instagram like 10 years ago or more. And same thing with TikTok, you know, like I wish I had started that sooner. Um, and like, I just started doing the shorts about a year ago, maybe two years ago. Um, that's brought in like a new audience. So it's like a challenge. Like it's, it's for me, it's fun. Like what I'm doing now is like every morning when I wake up, like I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll render and or edit an old video, you know, like a, anywhere from like a five to 10 minute video down into a 45 second short. 
so it's kind of like the challenge of like doing that so it's also kind of you know nostalgic too to like you know take this take this old material and make it new again so the people on tiktok have never seen it so it's new to them although they're like why do you have hair and no beard in one video and no hair and beard and <laughs> another video i couldn't what's even grow up? a beard until this year what uh what's what's your i don't know how do i phrase this what is your biggest what's the difference you see between when you started you started your channel what 2009 when was it 2008 actually 2008 between yeah. then and now not i'm not talking about beer and, and popularity and stuff like that but as far as like mm -hmm. your channel and beer tube and do you see a a, a a huge what's the biggest change and differences you see between when you started to where you're at now is it just the, uh, the, 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 the the accessibility the quality the the amount of yeah. platforms all that stuff like what is what's what's the biggest change for you yeah i probably just like the quality of the technology because like now like you know everybody has like at least like a 1080p camera and like you know back then everybody had like 480p snapshot cameras which is like what i recorded <laughs> on and like the ability like i have like a microphone now and like ring lights and you know so it's just i think it's just like the advancement in technology and like the ability to edit like nothing is really get like a whole lot to edit like um i mean like i try to like incorporate as much like you know it's like i like voice over like the pour and like the shot of the label and everything a lot of that comes from you remember uh beer geek nation yeah me and Stelzi did a yeah. review together yeah, he was huge, and he just kind of like disappeared, and like he yeah, was no, like the I, first. But we, I still, I still talk to him every now and then. I'm trying to get him I'm back for a back. podcast, actually. No, yeah, I, I, I'm like he's back. not. He doesn't want. He doesn't. He doesn't want to do it. Yeah, like right before he kind of xed out. Um, I actually yeah. did a podcast with the actually radio show with him, and then we did a, a live beer review together. That was kind of like a thing I always wanted to do, and and he might come back someday. Let's put it that way. Anyway, go ahead. Is your is that podcast on your podcast feed? Yeah, yeah. Just type in Beer Geek Nation. You should be able to. Is it recently? Up. No, a long time ago. Okay, I'll look pre. For it, but... I want to say it's 2008, 16, maybe seventeen, something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I'd actually like to get him on this show to be like, "Hey, where'd you go?" You know, and like, I'm yeah, sure he's still yeah. as much a beer nerd as he ever was, but. Yeah, like he he kind of yeah. I will give Chris credit because like he really like kind of broke through and like to make beer review more than just somebody just sitting in front of their camera just talking about a beer and like you know because he had like the cartoon effects and like actually and like he his I liked his shows because they were fairly short and breezy because like that's what like my inspiration has been for like the last actually it always was I always wanted to keep mine like as short as possible. Cause so I was like, nobody wants to sit here and watch me ramble for like 10 minutes, you know? Um, everybody's like yeah, such I'm short. The yeah. <laughs> I'm the complete opposite. Actually that's, and for that's a podcast, you can go mantra. as long as you want. Well, uh, well, my mantra has always been this because I feel like the, like when it comes to beer tube is mm -hmm. two things, be honest. And I don't think a mm -hmm. lot of people are, uh, and no, no edits whatsoever. I think that's hyper important. That that's always been my personal mantra is that you hit record, you talk, you hit end record, you post what you've said, because I think there's a lot of people that do jump cuts and edits that are basically like, they feel like they've said something wrong, or maybe they said something negative and they don't want to come off as being a negative Nancy or whatever they, it is. It's like, I, I feel like there's over, and that's my qualm with a lot of stuff today. I think there's an over edited portion of the show um there's a there's for me there's a i think there's two angles you can approach beer tube or any informational substrate as it's as an influencer or as a loose quote journalist mm -hmm. um someone that's giving the can be an op-ed it can be their opinion but it's also delivered in a matter of fact manner or you're just trying to say nice things in order to curry favor I feel like I, I want to be in the, in the, not the latter, but the former. You know, you know something I always wondered, how tall are you? I'm six even. Okay. I always thought you were even taller. I thought you were like six, five or something. <laughs> no, no. My kid's going to be gigantic, um, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm six, my wife is six. My wife is six one. 
Her brother is six wow. eight. Her father is six ten. Her uncle is six ten. Yeah, my kid's gonna be a gigantic human. Wow. <laughs> At least I grew up on a farm. Like they're gonna. You have a boy, right? Yeah, put him to work. That's what I'm saying. I yeah, have a kid. Just put him to work. Clark can. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll let you go. I will put links oh. to all of Matt's stuff in the show okay. notes and uh, and links to our review of London Pride. So if you ever want to do a collab Perfect. review, just let me know or do your podcast or whatever. Always game, brother. Yeah. Maybe I'll maybe I'll pick something and we'll do something on my channel. That way, we can yeah. no cross promotion. If you ever if you ever take like the family to Disney World in Florida, let me know because I'm right down the road from them. We'll will do. Or Daytona Beach. I'm not too far from there either. I don't think I'm taking my kid there, but yeah, <laughs> appreciate the offer. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. I will see you. I'll see you around. I'm sorry. I don't have anything to cheers you with. I'm all out. I'm empty too. Cheers. Yeah. Empty cheers. cheers. Yep. Bye.